Well, the time now is just after ten o'clock, and next this evening, our Sunday feature. Tonight, we present a portrait of Toru Takamitsu, the first Oriental composer to gain an international reputation. His concert music, his film scores, and his arrangements of pop songs are interwoven with the words of family, friends, and colleagues, and the sounds of gardens, which he found so inspiring. This is Enter the Garden. The composer's daughter. Oh, oh look there. Maki Takamitsu. He's dancing. He, he loved dancing. <laughs> Isn't this funny? In, in our house in the mountains, there is a small festival once a year. They do, you know, many stupid things like dancing and, and game and... and that year, he kept on dancing for like five hours or something. My mother and I were so embarrassed that <laughs> we couldn't even watch him. <laughs> Enter the garden. of Toru Takumitsu. The composer told Takemitsu and my father told Takemitsu are sort of different persons, so... So it's for me to recognize myself. Gardens give me energy. They provide a kind of self-affirmation. And what I like about gardens is that they don't exclude people. Just as music must not exclude people. Rutaru Takahara. The gardener. At the moment, I'm here in the middle of Tokyo's business district in a traditional Japanese garden, the Hama Rikyu Garden. As it appears now, it was designed 60 years ago on the site of the so-called Beach Palace of the fourth Tokugawa Shogun. There's a series of ponds filled with water from Tokyo Bay and many ancient pine trees, including one which is 300 years old. You can probably hear sounds from the construction site opposite. That's a typical city skyline overlooking this tranquil place. me when I was a baby, I don't know, two or three months, and my, my father, well, that's Peter Greedy here. Peter Greedy, Japanese expert and friend. When you look at Toru's biography, I think it says a lot. Toru was born in Japan, but he grew up in Manchuria. His father was sent to Manchuria as part of the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, the, the, so Toru always thought of Japanese culture and the Japanese experience, in a sense, as an outsider, because he matured as a Japanese but living outside of Japan. It gave him a rather unique perspective. He could see the difficulties Japan had in communicating with the rest of the world, and the whole period of the 30s and the 40s and the Second World War is just the most horrendous example of broken communications. He was 14 or 15, right before the World War II ended. 
And Toru very often told this wonderful story about working in a, in a sort of military supply camp in the mountains. He was a teenager. He was 14. Uh, he was forced to labor in an army base, Japanese army base. And he wanted to hear music, but there was no real music to listen to except for marching songs and military songs. And but one of the officers, one night, he called those young kids to his, his room or something, and they let those kids listen to one chanson. A friend of his had smuggled in a recording of French chanson. It was Parlez-moi d'amour. It's called Parlez-moi d'amour. That's, of course, you know, the song from enemy country, so... And in the middle of the night, in secret, they were playing this for forbidden music, like eating forbidden candy. And that's what my father told me, and, and, and he was really moved by that sweet melody and sweet tune. It was so moving to him that music could have that power. My father decided to be a musician if the war ends. But that's the point, if the war ever ends. He never forgot that. He talked about it constantly in, in, in years afterwards. It was almost a miracle for him to, to be a composer and to make a living out of it, you know. So, you know, he was quite satisfied with that. In the days immediately after the war, Toru was very ill, malnutrition, he had pneumonia. He basically spent, I think, four or five years lying in a sick bed, first in hospitals and then at home. In a sense, cut off from the world. But what he did do was listen constantly to the radio. And that was the window on the outside world. There was virtually 24 hours a day on the Armed Forces radio station of American music. And alongside of Toscanini's broadcast with the NBC Orchestra was a lot of jazz. Well, Toru just listened and listened and listened day in and day out and absorbed an extraordinary amount of music. And later on, looking back on his life where uh, he had never really studied in a music school, he never formally studied composition, he had no real formal teachers in music. When people asked him, how did you learn music? Well, how, did, how did you gain these skills? He said, my only real teacher was Duke Ellington. It was, uh, I think, five years after the war. Joji Yuasa, composer, friend. I went to the concert, his first public performance of his music. And at that time, I think he was 19 years old, and I was uh, 20. I thought this is marvelous music and quite different from the other composers. So um, we went to, to the backstage and I, we saw Toru. And since then, we, we have a kind of a exchanging all kinds of philosophical thinking or artistic idea and, and music. I'm a composer, and music is often called the art of time. On the other hand, gardens are constructions of space. The Toru was fascinated with gardens and what gardens represent in a culture, the, the way human beings associate themselves with nature through the act of gardening, although he himself wasn't anything of a gardener at all in the in the usual sense. He didn't get his hands dirty, he didn't mess in the ground, and he didn't plant things. Gardens to him were uh, more of a psychic phenomenon, a metaphysical phenomenon. For example, when he would get a commission, 
one of the first things he would do would be to go to one of his favorite Japanese gardens in Kyoto or some, somewhere else and pace through that garden for 20 minutes. If the piece was to be 20 minutes, he assigned himself 20 minutes and he would walk around the garden for 20 minutes, observing and feeling the various phenomena, the physical phenomena in the garden, a rock here, tree, pond, and use them as kind of uh, part of his sketch pad for this piece. He has an idea to walk around the Japanese traditional garden and as he walks, the scene is changing, almost like uh, uh, suddenly he finds the, the other world. He tried to develop his music, like walking around the garden. The but when I'm in a garden, what impresses me most are the various layers of time. Various kinds and quality of time form layers. They accumulate. Rocks hardly change at all. They're a stable presence. But plants change with the seasons. They come and go. They die away. I try to work these elements into an orchestra. Parts that change quickly, others that don't change at all, like the rocks. Enveloping it all are the earth and the sky. And sometimes it rains. So really what I do is I compose gardens with music. で、大体今あの、Now it's late March and we're in the cherry blossom season. At night the garden is lit up for the people in the buildings and offices around here to see. The cherry tree is Japan's national emblem, though not officially. And Sakura, cherry blossom, sweeps across Japan each spring, just for a week or two. The entire country is carpeted with blossom. It's beautiful and seems to chime with our sense of values and virtue. It's rooted in us from when we're small. We value Sakura for being so brief, so fleeting. No, I don't know. Oh, that's Bach. Oh, that's... that's Brahms Tchaikovsky. <laughs> I don't really know what Japanese music is and what Western music is because, you know, I'm, I was growing up in an environment where, you know, all kinds of music were around, so... Oh, yeah, that's... Oh, that's Oli. Oli Vernassi. Even from the back, we could tell. <laughs> Oliver Nussen, conductor and friend. He had a very ambivalent relationship with Japanese culture. He used to say, I hate Japan. I hate Japan, but I love Japan. Some of his music sounds quite Western, but um, in the deep side of, of his mind, there's apparently a Japanese mind. So that no matter how he was influenced by Debussy and Messiaen, but still I think Takemitsu had his own. And at that time we were very young. Um, we felt that we didn't know uh, 
much about our own culture too. So that. もちろん庭っていうのはどんな天才がデザインしても庭は生き物だから時間がまた作ってくるわけで。Of course, no matter what genius may have designed a garden, it's a living thing. And time remakes it. Muso, the famous designer of the mosque temple garden in Kyoto, seems to have allowed for the changes that time would bring. What I think is very interesting about what he brought from Japanese thinking to Western music is a formal thing, which is not at all obvious. At first, at all, basically each piece is a collection of small pieces, not fragments, because they're rounded. They have beginnings and ends.、Um, they're separated usually by silences. They are between 15 seconds and a couple of minutes long, and he places these next to each other simply、uh, to make a sort of Uh, what he thought of as a satisfying continuity. In music, I would say, the silence is not the pause, but silence ha- has a actually energy, so that we think the sound itself has its own energy, and silence also has energy, and that is quite closely connected to Japanese、uh, traditional idea. When I used to work with him on performances, he would be very, very picky about exactly how long the silences should be between these little fragments. It was like how you place flower beds or plants in a garden, and then you tr- trace a route around them. The titles. That have the word garden in them are the pieces that I'm the most drawn to. The flock descends into the pentagonal garden and then spirit garden. Marin Orthop, conductor. I might mistake it for Debussy. I mean, I think that's the closest connection for me of a very impressionistic. Kind of approach, but at the same time, I think it's more contemporary and more sparse. I think that's where the Eastern elements come in. It's like one of those incredible. Miniatures that the Japanese create, to me, you know, absolutely every detail is there for a reason. And even if we don't understand it as Westerners,、uh, we can appreciate that everything has a significance. David Sylvian, pop musician, and friend. His music is one of the, I think, probably the only form of music that I, that I see colours when I listen to it. I mean, it's very visual.、Um, I know it's visually inspired work because he was very inspired by by what he saw, what he experienced. Obviously, he talks extensively about you know Japanese formal gardens, and he loved to talk about that in connection to his work. Um, but also, he was very much into visual art, and I think that also, you know, inspired the works that he created in, in many ways. And, and obviously, cinema. Cinema was incredibly important to him,、um, and, and consequently, his work has that visual component. I mean, it draws pictures in the imagination. It kind of leads you through that、um, ornamental garden, if you will. You know, he takes you by the hand and, and walks you through, and it's like going on a journey with a very dear friend. And、um, It's very impressionistic, you know. It really brings images to mind, and so in that sense, I find it beautiful work and inspiring、um, and moving. I mean, it's very emotional. I think. Here 
uses many harmonics like this is uh, Fajoret. Daisuke Suzuki, guitarist. Guitar music is in the middle between art and uh, pop. Not like completely Western and not like very, very Asian. It's in the middle. That's why Takemisu-san liked guitar very much. Guitar sound is very similar to the sound of wind, trees, and, and also water. Music by Takemitsu is always harmonically very Western and European or American, but it has time like Japanese. It's not like one, two, three, four. It's like one and two, three, four kind of haiku or something. The sound of the wind through the trees rustling the leaves is very important. Natural sounds are always considered when designing a formal Japanese garden. The sounds of birds, water, and so on. A garden is not just a visual experience. As a very close friend for a long time, nearly 50 years, he has, um, so to speak, 100 different faces. <laughs> and that is very characteristic and very interesting person and lovely because of that. He has two very extreme characters in himself. And some people really think that he's always like meditating or something. But uh, at the same time, he really liked the chaos of the city, you know, chaos of Tokyo. He really liked the noise also. Whenever he had to talk about his work, his, his pieces, he mainly talks about the garden and the nature and the, the sound of birds and, you know, the sound of the wind. Unbeknownst to me, a friend of mine, a musician friend of mine, was also a friend of, of Takamitsu's, and he informed Toru that I'd sampled his work on a particular record, and um, I think Toru was quite intrigued by the fact that this kind of aberrant pop musician had sampled his work. Once again, I'm hiding in He worked in house in Tokyo, but mainly he worked in house in, in Nagano Prefecture. And when he had to, to concentrate on composing, he, he was mainly there. Also, if he's in Tokyo, he had many temptations, you know, going to bar, and he kind of forced himself to, to get away from all these, you know, excitements <laughs> in city. <laughs> He was an extremely quirky person. I mean, very charming, very, very, in a way, elegant, small, and screamingly funny. He was tiny, 
very, very tiny fellow. He was barely five feet tall, very frail, and yet there was this extraordinary power about him, a real backbone of steel. And in fact, it's very difficult for me to talk about his music divorced from what I know about him as a person, although I was very attracted to his music long before I met him. There was an extraordinary kind of confidence about the man that was so unexpected. He was very reserved, but accessible. You could tell there was an openness, that we, it wasn't a closed-mindedness, it wasn't a, a kind of protective persona. I mean, he was just very quiet, um, but contained, you would say, maybe you would use that word instead. And, uh, you know, the next step was to, well, shall we go out for a drink, you know, and that, that was by his invitation. And, and that seemed to be what happened night after night from that point onwards. This, we'd go, f you know, bar hopping with Takamitsu and he could drink us all under the table and, and really not look worse for wear. You know, his, his smile might get a little broader, he might get a little more talkative. And he did have a, a, a very wry sense of humor. And he would sometimes withdraw in the middle of a, an evening and withdraw into himself. And in that sense, he could be quite inscrutable. You know, quite sure where he was going and you know where his thoughts had taken him and that happened on occasion but generally he was a very accessible very likable person I mean as a, as a father he was almost I would say perfect the only thing he kept on telling me to do was to watch films but that's about it he was more like my big brother so we had a fight you know when I was really a kid and my mom always said, like, not the fight between daughter and the father, but more like, you know, big brother and small sister. It was more like wrestling. <laughs> when I write a piece of music, I note on the score the sort of emotion I have in mind. I may think that a piece of music about a garden should be calm and still, but at the same time, it should be a strong calm. So I say, ecstatic. One might think you can't combine the two, calm and ecstasy, but there are moments in a Japanese garden that are very still and restful, but something intensely sensual, almost erotic, is going on at the same time. There's a sensuality about it that maybe we don't associate with, with a Japanese culture. And the Eastern cultures are very, they're, they're very erotic in, I think, a high art kind of way. And that's what's so attractive about his music. I think it's clear and clean, but it's also seductive. There's a very refined beauty about the whole enterprise, you know, an orchestral work of Takamitsu's. It's enormously refined. It has that strange dichotomy that you find in Japanese culture, which is a very masculine culture, patriarchal culture, if you will, but there's an enormous appreciation of beauty, the most delicate beauty. Um, even if you go back to Japanese warriors and, and the ornamentation that they use and, and the way that they would present themselves. I mean, it was a refined aesthetic. And I think maybe you could see something of that in, in Takamitsu's work, that it's an enormously refined aesthetic that's at work creating these very detailed uh, compositions. But it has this masculine quality. It's not a feminine work, but it has a great beauty to it. Fujikura, composer. Well, I don't think that Takemitsu could write those music uh, without knowing Debussy or Messiaen. But there's always something else. I mean, the structure of his music, and there's silences in old places and the pauses in old places. I really don't think it's a, it sounds like anything I know from other, other composers. I mean, not like Debussy, not unlike Messiaen, I think. You know, in daily life, he enjoyed listening more 
uh, jazz or rock or you know different kind of music. His whole harmonic way of thinking came about because he discovered a pamphlet by an American jazz musician called George Russell called The Lydian Chromatic Concept of Tonal Organization. But Tori got a hold of this and saw something interesting in it, and apparently this approach to harmony informs most of the late pieces from A Flock Descends onwards. You might say that Takemitsu's relationship to Western musical culture is almost like a mirror image of Cage's relationship to Eastern musical culture, particularly from the point of view of form and what is chance and what is fixed. And the Cage influence is crucial because it's what stops him from being an ordinary Western conservative concert composer in many ways. Oh, he loved Beatles, he loved Prince, and some Japanese, you know, pop musicians in Piazzolla. Uh, he, he liked David Sylvia, of course. <laughs> many, many different kinds of music. Looking around Hamariku Garden, you see rocks and boulders that once might have been used as places to sit. Now we have benches. But rock is something eternal in a garden, not like the trees and plants, which are more fragile and changeable. Stones resist the rain and the strongest wind. There are many ways to use rocks in a traditional Japanese garden, perhaps to shape waterfalls or surround ponds, all sorts of things. They are permanent. In the 70s, he was, became very fascinated with gagaku, the most ancient form of music that still exists in Japan. And it's really music that came originally from China. And he eventually produced a wonderful score called In an Autumn Garden. Maybe the most favorite piece of his is In an Autumn Garden. I've used myself the two traditional Japanese instruments, and I know how limited those instruments are, because Japanese instruments, they refuse to develop. Completely for ancient gagaku instruments, but it's a totally contemporary modern piece of music. I found an autumn garden on vinyl back in the late 70s, it must have been. I loved the, the uh, gagaku instrumentation anyway. It was something I was really drawn to, just the, the keening sounds of those instruments. And to hear it in this modern composition really, you know, was, was quite something else. I'm just so impressed that uh, he could write one hour long amazing music with those very limited instruments. beautiful, but instruments are from 6th century. In the process of working on that, he did a film for Shinoda, Banished Orin, another title that goes by in, in the West is Melody in Grey. But the score, I think, is one of the greatest scores, of, one of Takemitsu's finest pieces of film music. Masahiro Shinoda film director and friend. Takamitsu watched lots of films, about 300 a year, so he knew a lot about film music and how sound is used in films. The first time we worked together was in 1960. He was very conscious of the sound of the wind or a door closing or footsteps. And, like Hitchcock, he was sensitive to the power of pure sound. So he didn't always write music for a scene, but used found sounds and effects. He discovered music concrete through film, 
And he thought of the music and the soundtrack working like a double-layered fugue with the visual images. Once, when we were recording the music for my film Assassin, we booked the music session, but only one shakuhachi player and a pianist turned up. The producer looked a bit worried. How could two players accompany the central fight scene? You know, I never told Takumitsu what to write. We used to operate together almost by chance. But with these limited instruments and fewer notes than you might expect, Takumitsu composed a really effective musical scene. The man was absolutely, uh, what's the word, fertile, incredibly fertile in all, on all fronts. He wrote a thriller, a detective story, a sort of Zen detective story, and it was untranslatable because the whole thing depended on the different meanings of Chinese characters in Chinese and Japanese. So we will never read it. <laughs> yeah, that's our house in the, in the mountain. When he's there, he always cooked. He really wanted to be there all by himself, so he said it was a really good break for him, you know, three meals a day, and he enjoyed cooking there. When he was in the hospital in the last year of his life, uh, he was he was dying of cancer. He knew he was dying of cancer. He missed two things enormously. One was film. He simply had no chance, except on television, which he didn't really like very much, to see movies. And when, he, when he'd been healthy, he'd gone to 300 movies a year, in a, in a good year. And to be deprived of that was very difficult for him. The other thing that he just felt so strongly the deprivation of was good food and, and eating. You know, hospital food is the worst in the world. So he would lie in his hospital bed dreaming up menus and dreaming up recipes and write them down and he illustrate them. And if you look at his collection, it's been published, his collection of recipes, Takemitsu's cookbook, some of them are utterly fantastic recipes not to be attempted in any kitchen. Uh, but some of them are very practical, real, real recipes. It was fascinating to watch him go through the process of creating meals and recipes and then watch him illustrate them because the illustrations are every bit as precise as his musical scores. He would draw a mushroom so carefully with every line there. There are like the TV shows to, to invite, you know, different person from different, uh, you know, career. And, and introduce his, his recipe or something. And I think he cooked curry rice, but which my mother trained him for like, you know, two days or something. <laughs> and he pretended like, you know, he always does cook, but <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, he did in the show. This man was an extraordinary man to have so many different parts come together in one, one human being. All the trees in this garden are between one and three hundred years old. This sculpted pine tree is very famous. It was planted to celebrate the renovation of the garden at the time of the sixth shogun three hundred years ago. And its gnarled, twisting branches have been trained to grow outwards rather than up. This is so that it doesn't block the sight line through to the far side of the garden, the pond and the flower field beyond. No one could expect he died, even Mrs. Takemitsu Asaka-san or Maki or us. He went quite suddenly, quite unexpectedly. 
and、um, I think it was too early for him. He was a tremendously talented friend. I think the best way to describe it. He had friends everywhere, close friends, people who now still miss him. だから彼は日本人でありながら日本をを見るのに日本の外から見見える日本のシルエットに。Takamitsu loved the silhouette of Japan when he looked at it from outside the country, but when he was at home in Japan, he had a longing for Western ideas and places, the Europe of Debussy and the composers who attracted him. And you know, he once said to me, almost like a confession, "I do write Western music, don't I?" Confession したことがあります。I don't think Toru would be surprised at all that his music is still being listened to 11 years after his death, and that people still care about his music. He cared about his music, and he knew that he was doing something valuable and, and important. <laughs> he looks really serious in this picture. He used to smoke a lot, so he he has a cigarette there. He quit when he was he became forty, forty-five. Quit smoking, but then he started smoking again whenever he's at the bar. But my mom doesn't know that. <laughs> I think he would be. Totally surprised by the fact that、uh, a Japanese publisher recently published this enormous five-box set of CDs of the complete works of Takemitsu, the same publisher who, in previous years, published the complete Bach and then the complete Mozart. I think he'd be surprised seeing himself put quite in that category. But he had great determined confidence about what he was doing in music. Oh, another thing he told me was not to be a musician and not to marry a musician. Maybe that was, you know, in a way that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> Enter the garden. Was produced by Alan Hall. It was a falling tree production for BBC Radio Three. Tonight's edition of the Sunday feature, the recording of Toru Takamitsu, was made available courtesy of Kajima Vision Productions. The readers were Simon Poland. Jonathan Keeble and Emma Fielding, and the programme was first produced and broadcast in the April of 2007.